Get this track, get this track, go, go, let's go. go. My Colorado swing. My Colorado swing. My Colorado swing. I think they like my Colorado sway, cause when I'm in it play, I don't really, I don't really know just how to act, and when I'm in it go, you know I'm acting bad, holly get a bus with my Colorado sway, my Colorado sway, my Colorado sway, I think they like, I think they like my Colorado sway, my Colorado sway, my Colorado sway, my Colorado sway, man I swear I think they like my Colorado sway, my Colorado sway, it's pushing 180, Speeding past competition, see you later, baby. baby. Colorado Army, with soldiers like the Navy. Yeah. And voters where we stationed, patiently awaiting. Oh. When I hit the field, it's so hard to behave. Yeah. I'm Colorado swagging, it's the crowd do the wave. Look into my eyes, I'll be sick of you, right? Uh -huh. Cause you know we finna hit ya, hit ya, hit ya. Welcome into the DNVR Buffs post game show presented by Green Mountain Dental Group. Uh, so glad that you guys are all here to hang out with us. What a great game! Uh, I'm Henry Chisholm. Uh, up here, well, I guess we'll just start with Ben. This is Ben Girding right over here, the uh, DNVR Buffs intern. Uh, we have Ryan Konigsberg on this side right there. Uh, Ryan, how are you feeling? Whoo, baby, a little victory whiskey, 1-0 and to start the season. Oh, God, it feels good. It feels really, really good. I'm really, really proud of that football team. Dude, they look so good. Like, like I, I think all of the questions that we had coming into it, you know, can Sam Neuer run a functional offense? Uh, can the Buffs survive with this roster without Alex Fontenot? Basically, the answer to all of the questions was a resounding yes, and it was just so much fun to watch. You know, it got ugly there for a second, but for the most part, all the way through. Uh, ben, your quick thoughts, initial reaction. How do you feel about this game? Yeah, I mean, Henry, you and I talked during that head coaching search so much at length about how much we wanted to see a, an offensive mind brought in here to really spice things up. Wasn't needed as Darren Shemarine really pulled a lot of tricks out of his hat today, showed a lot of, you know, dynamic playmaking, really utilized the strengths of his players well. And, you know, overall, obviously, they put up 48 points. I mean, that's unheard of going into this game. We would see that kind of offensive output. Seriously, they look so good. Um, I'm so excited to go back through this game, honestly. You know, early on, watching those first couple of plays, the screens, all that kind of stuff, I was like, oh no, this offense kind of looks like it's working too much horizontally. Maybe they aren't going to be able to get the ball downfield. And then Sam Neuer, whenever asked, is hitting guys in the chest, 15 yards downfield, 20 yards downfield. It doesn't matter. He is a good quarterback. Um, Ryan, in Darren Cheverini's first game as offensive coordinator, how would you grade him? Well, not technically his first game, but well, uh, true. uh, his first game this time around, um, was fantastic. I mean, they scored 48 points. Like, this is gonna be you're gonna, you're gonna hear this message from me over and over and over throughout this show. The Buffs just scored 48 points and won a conference game. Like, I don't need to hear much else. Yes, was there bumps in the road? Of course, there's gonna be bumps in the road for a team this generally young across the board who got screwed over by a coach who abandoned them in the middle of the off season, had to bring in a new guy and went through a pandemic. Like we knew mistakes were going to happen, but the bus just scored 48 points and won a conference game. And, and, and that's all that matters to me. So hats off uh, to Darren Cheverini for calling a great game for knowing and identifying in the off season that Jarek Broussard was an absolute weapon and taking what he had in, in that weapon and riding him to a win. Yeah, the, there's so much to talk about, so many good things to talk about. Um, but first, we need to let Ben go because the plan for tonight is uh, for him to go listen into the press conference, hear what the storylines are according to Carl Durrell and a couple of the players, and then come report back to us with some information. Until then, you guys. I thought can you were saying out. like I thought you were saying like we we had to let him go, like he was fired. Oh yeah, bad take, bad take. Okay. I can't remember what his take was. Darren Cheverini <laughs> looked good. Don't need an offensive mind. Sure. Bad take. He's gone. Um, let's talk Jarek Broussard. 
because yeah. to me that is the most exciting storyline. Uh, he can just do so many different things. And I think that's what's so impressive is you see him get the ball and you know that he can fly like that is the the book on him. That's like his strength. But then to just see the patience and the way that he's willing to, you know, wait for the hole to develop and then boom, just hit it. He can shake right past somebody in the hole, like partially just because he's so small. But that is a really dynamic running back that I think that the buffs can lean on past this week, past the point where you don't have Alex Fontenot and you know, at, at the very least, I think this is a 50-50 split. Yeah, I mean, hopefully Fontenot is back soon because if he is, you have a dangerous one-two punch. It's crazy to say it, but, like, you know, Jarek Broussard ended the game with, what, 30 carries? Yeah, 31, I think. Yeah, 31 carries. You, you don't want to do that um, across a full season, although the season is shortened, so maybe you could get away with it this year. But there's a massive drop off between when he was out there and when the other guys were out there. You know, Mangum, he he's okay. Um, you know, like uh, he's just there's su- in college football. I said this the other day when I'm watching CSU run McElroy. It's just like the power back in college football is just a dying idea. Um, teams, especially in the Pac-12, have had to get smaller and smaller and smaller on defense because they need to get faster and faster and faster on defense. And so, like, pounding it into them, um, you you feel like, uh, you know, would would work, but it just doesn't. You need that slipperiness. You need that elusiveness. And, man, there were, the, the jump cut that Jarek Broussard has in his bag, like, it's so weird not knowing anything about these players. And then they just come out there and you're like oh my god he has an incredible jump cut he has great vision he has great patience like how did we had no idea i had no idea um so the jump cut was sexy uh and he's just making plays out there he's slippery you know you think you have a hand on him and then he kind of twists out of it and gets three more yards it's it's uh really really encouraging to see but you're you know if you get Fontenot back that one two punch is going to be nasty yeah and and i like what you said about mangum too because (sighs) There's just still something missing. You know, I, I, you can look through, like we've talked about on the DMVR Buffs podcast quite a bit, but the pro football focus stats with him being, I think, like 33rd out of 37 qualified Pac-12 running backs last year in terms of the ability to make guys miss and make tacklers not bring you down. And it, it did seem like there was a little bit more wiggle. There was one run on the sideline where he did kind of like get somebody, but you know, you have to remember he was a, a freshman last year. He's a sophomore this year. And when you have this many running backs, you just need to find a role for him. And I think down by the goal line, they came close to figuring out how to use him. Right. But there is still something that's just a little bit off. What really surprised me the most about him though, was the way they used him early. It seemed like the first three, four possessions every time he was on the field, every time he was in the backfield before the snap, they would motion him out and and have him play receiver, which is not what you'd expect a guy like Jaron Mangum to be doing. Uh, just given the skill set, given that he is more of like your bulldozer type of back. And so that was kind of an interesting thing to me. And I think that throughout the season, we're going to see things kind of change in the ways that these running backs are used, you know, which combinations, what situations um, do you put multiple running backs on the field when you have Fontenot and Broussard both going, you know, at some point you might get a shot Clayton going too. And then I really don't know what you do, but, but you see the receivers too rotating in a similar way. Saw a lot of Maurice Bell, saw a whole lot of Brendan Rice, um, which is really exciting. And uh, the, there's just so much to like about this team right now, uh, and especially offensively after putting up 48 points. But Jarek Broussard has to lead the way. Like He is just so dynamic that I'm not even sure if this is just a like UCLA's defense isn't all that good thing. He looks like he's just a legitimate running back. He's dynamic. Um, they blocked their asses off for him out there, so the offensive line mm-hmm. deserves some credit. Uh, and that also, you know, made you feel more confident that that wasn't just a fluky, you know, oh, UCLA is garbage. Uh, he's gonna. I'm sure he's not going to go, you know, for 180 yards on six yards of carry for the entire season. But you saw a player who is dynamic. Um, and it kind of a little bit bums me out that Jarek Broussard was so damn good 
that the spotlight's a little bit off of Sam Neuer. But I got to take my hat off to that kid. I can't actually do it because I have the headphones and that would be a mess. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of Buffs fans, and, and I love Buffs fans. Buffs fans are my people. But a lot of Buffs fans, like, lost their minds when Sam Neuer was named the head, the, the starting quarterback. And it was just like, hi, w- what are you doing? You know, what, what's the point of being so upset over someone that you've almost never even seen play the position, let alone with a whole off season or a, a, you know, a kind of off season as a guy who's competing for the starting job. Like we've never seen that Sam Neuer. And so I just, I, from the start, I didn't understand why people were freaking out over it. It's just like, let him, let him play, like let the kid play and see what happens. Um, you saw what it means to have a fifth year senior quarterback out on the field, zero turnovers from him, maybe a couple interceptable passes, but on the whole, he was very, composed he was calm from the ver- first start of the game I was from the first snap of the game I was like okay he's not this is the moment isn't too big for him he's you know he's a man out there and I was just so I was so proud of the kid to go out there forget about all the noise people you know losing their minds over him being a starting quarterback and just playing a composed football game he wasn't necessarily dynamic although as a runner he reminded me a, a lot of Sefa Lufa out there running people over um, but he just went out there and played like a fifth year senior playing quarterback. And that gave, I mean, from, from the first drive of the game, it settled my nerves down just seeing him, you know, command the football game. Yeah, he, he really was in control. And, and that was so obvious uh, to me, mostly on the third downs. That's where it became clear, even early in the game. Uh, his ability to just wait in the pocket for something to come open and shout out to that offensive line for creating a pocket. But it did seem like he was not scared of the moment at all he was not scared of his first career start at all you know going through the third downs I guess there was like the one missed throw to Brady Russell who was kind of open waiting at the sticks but outside of that I think that the story of the game to me really is the way that he just ran everything he kept the offense on schedule he made everything look so easy out there and and running the ball you know a couple of weeks ago he actually said um that the quarterbacks have been told you're either sliding you're getting out of bounds or you're scoring a touchdown not what happened no (laughs) (laughs) but but i mean he's a former safety it seems like he should be able to take some contact i honestly don't really mind him being willing to take some shots he looked, you know, I talked about this with Cam Newton all season, and I was like, the Patriots are using Cam Newton like a guy they don't expect to have back next year. You know, they're just saying like, oh, let's just go use Cam Newton uh, and just run him into the ground, and whatever happens, happens. The Panthers couldn't do that because they viewed him as their franchise quarterback for the longest time. The, uh, Sam Neuer looked like a guy who was just like, I'm leaving it all on the field. I don't care about anything else. And he's almost proved himself so valuable to the team tonight that now I'm like, whoa, 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 please don't look between the first quarter when I was like, hell yeah, run someone over in the third quarter. I was like, Hey, Hey, we can't afford to lose you. And you're like, you're now a big part of this offense. So, um, man, you know, just in that game, I don't know what's going to happen the rest of the season. And, and I've been very vocal about the fact that I'm just being patient with the buffs. Like I have low expectations for them. I don't want to, uh, you know, put, put expectations on them that aren't fair based on the conditions that they've had. But that Sam Neuer looked like a guy who's going to, who's going to leave his career as a, you know, like a low key fan favorite, just a guy that people said like, man, that guy had, he was tough. He was gritty. He wasn't the most talented kid in the world, but he really, he put, he left it all out there for his team. And, and that gets me hyped. Like that's what I ask of players who, you know, put on the uniform. I just want to be proud to say that you're a buff, you know, and, and I, I was, I was proud to say that Sam Neuer was a buff tonight. Yeah. You know, if, if he does get hurt, we did get a quick glimpse of what that offense would look like without him. What, what was, was that? that? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Tyler Lytle subbing in when you're up 21 to seven, you're, you're at, at midfield too. Everything is working. This seems like a situation where you just try to keep building on the lead. I don't understand. I just don't understand. <laughs> like, okay, so there's a couple things that could be a play here. One, Sam had like a equipment issue and they had to work on something. We'll find out hopefully from Ben here in a second. Yeah. Um, the other that I think is the most likely is they told Tyler Lytle like, hey, listen, 
Sam's going to be the starting quarterback, but you're going to get a chance to play here and there. And, uh, you know, stick with us. We're going to give you opportunities. You're still young. You have three years left in this program. So, you know, don't feel like this decision that we're making right now is the end of your career at Colorado. And I think, you know, the truth is when players can now transfer, what's the deal this year? Is it still up to four games? You can play four games and still um, uh, this year redshirt? The, this doesn't count as eligibility for anybody. Right. So, so you can – so. He, he could decide to transfer at any point and it's not going to cost him. And I think there's a little bit of protection going on there of like, Hey, we don't want to lose him because we still like him. We still believe in him. We want to go with Sam this year. We're going to promise him that he gets in there once in a while. Now I just have to assume, was that the fourth or fifth drive of the game? Uh, it would have been fifth. I think. Okay. I, I have to assume they said like, you're going in on the fifth drive and they just, wanted to stick with what they told him. They didn't want to lie to him, you know? Um, I think that they should have and just said, like, <laughs> dude, we're up 21-7. Like, we can't – we have to roll with Sam. He's rolling right now. And I feel like Tyler Adel would have had to understand that. But – He knows football. He yeah, can see yeah, what's exactly. happening on that field. Um, uh, and it's not his fault they had a holding on the first play and the, and the drive was kind of doomed from there. But just the optics of it are bad when you score on – three out of four drives to start the game. And then on the fifth drive, you bring in a new guy off a turnover <laughs> and sixth drive of the game. Producer Allie just told us. So uh, I, 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 it was crazy. I mean, thank God it didn't end in disaster and the buffs won. And, you know, uh, I talk about this a lot with the Broncos this year, but it applies to the buffs. You love learning lessons as a winning team. Winning and learning at the same time is the best thing that can happen in football. And this team is young. They're in a new coach. They have a new coach that, you know, they're learning a new system on offense. They're growing up in that system on defense. If you can learn lessons and win football games, best possible scenario. And I think the Buffs and Carl Durrell and all the coaching staff learned a lot of lessons tonight. Uh, and one of those lessons to me, Henry, is don't um, – Teeter totter between aggressive and conservative. Have an identity. Become an aggressive team. You know, I'll always lean towards aggressive because that's just you know what I think is the better option. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be a conservative team, be a conservative team and lean into that. And that means don't you know go for it on fourth and three from the thirty or whatever they did early in the game, and then turn around and not go for it later in the game. I just want to have an identity. Stick to something. But you know. Coaches can learn. It's a, they're allowed to learn things. And Carl Durrell could have learned tonight that he, he wants to be a, a, an aggressive team. Or maybe he wants to be a conservative team. Have an identity, though. Stick to it. I think that's an important takeaway uh, for Carl Durrell coming away from this game. Because he kind of flip-flopped throughout the game on whether he wanted to be aggressive or passive. Yeah. You know, th there were a couple of questionable calls uh, on his part. Uh, with the other one being... I mean, probably the biggest one right before the half deciding to run the clock down. You know, they're at the 33 yard line with three timeouts right there. I think there was what a third and one right in front of them. Obviously, they've been running the ball incredibly well. And, you know, it turns out that with the knowledge that we have now, you could make the case that they made like in hindsight, the right decision, because what happened was they missed that field goal after not picking up the third down. And that meant that what the, the ball goes to UCLA at the 40 yard line. Yeah. They only had three seconds instead of having like a legitimate amount of time to go try to score. And so maybe, maybe we can spin that into that being the right call. You don't seem like you buy it. No. Okay. No. Um, you had a chance here to avoid what happened, which was you won by six points, which is crazy when you were up by 28 at one point. Um, and and I, I, like, I know what was going through Carl Durrell's head, which is just like, if we, like the, the last thing I want to happen in my first game as a head coach here is I get too aggressive because I'm feeling it and I'm playing my former team and I want to stick it to their asses. And I screw up. I get too greedy. and. Sam Neuer throws a pick six and the game completely flips on its head. So I, I know what was going through his head. Hey, let's just be conservative. Make sure we end. Cause like 
we all saw it. Like it was 14, right? It was at that point, it was 35 14. They had just gotten a stop on defense, which gave you, which would have had UCLA a chance to make it 35 21. And we all saw, like, we all thought it at the start of that drive, which was like, Jesus, just make sure the half ends on this drive. Don't give them another chance to go score points. So I get the, the thought process, but there was no reason to not believe in your offense in that moment. It's not like they had just committed a turnover or they had just done anything that would make you lose confidence. So just you got to believe in your guys. Um, and again, that goes into this flip flopping between being conservative and being uh, aggressive, like, aggressiveness tells your players that you believe in him. And I thought they sowed a seed of doubt in the players right then as to whether they believed in him. Push the ball down the field, try to go score a touchdown, and at worst, kick a short field goal. Yeah, especially when you have the weapons they have. You know, with with Daniel Arias, it wasn't, it wasn't the game that I'd hoped for him tonight, if I'm being totally honest. I wanted more out of him. He did get the one big play. Um, play the game. But- I mean, at least... The play that sealed the game. That's true. That is very true. But in those situations, end of the half, it, it can feel like 30 seconds is a long time to be trying to, or isn't that long to be trying to go another 33 yards to to score a touchdown instead of kicking a field goal. And when you think of it that way, it's like, well, maybe if we're probably going to wind up getting the field goal anyway, let's get the field goal. Don't risk giving him any time. But to me, when you have somebody like Daniel Arias, lob one up like like yeah. you have more explosive ability in this offense even without katie nixon um which is important to remember there's even more juice coming to this offense but even without him you have the weapons to go downfield and score and i, I would have liked to have seen some more downfield passes um just because for the most part sam was money when given the opportunity opportunity not even not even for the most part he straight up was like he was just money when he was when he was given time and uh, you know an opportunity, he made the play for the most part. I, I guess you're right, saying for the most part. But honestly, like, what did he miss? One throw that he should have had. Yeah, I mean, there was the other one. There was like the free play on third down early, like first half when he did have some open receivers underneath. He push it down the field, left a little bit short. But even that, I don't hate the decision. And he put the ball in a place where only his guy could go get it. I guess that doesn't matter free play, but yeah, he he was really good. And I think that a lot of this game management stuff honestly kind of comes back to Carl Durrell being back in college football. College football is a really long game, a really long game. And you need to keep your foot on the pedal for a really long time. It's not like the NFL. I mean, that game didn't end for three and a half, 345. And and with all those stoppages in there, it, it can be so quickly that a team can get back into the game. Um, it, you got to keep your foot on the gas. You got to keep your foot on the gas. I think no matter what, probably through the third quarter and at least through halftime, um, even if you do have that run game working, be multiple. You have the opportunity to be multiple. And, and Carl has spoken a lot about how balanced he wants this offense to be got to throw the ball and you need to stress them just a little bit more downfield going forward. Again, Sam Neuer's first game game plan can say, maybe you don't do that right away, but I would have liked more. Okay. But we should talk about, and someone asked earlier, can you expand on your tweet that Mel Tucker was holding the buffs back? That was a joke. (laughs) Um, I was just kidding because you know, everyone was so beside themselves when he left rightfully. So I was too, Uh, but I was just flipping that on its head and saying, Oh, he was holding them back. Uh, And you combine that with the fact that Michigan state suffered their worst loss in program history today. And uh, you know, it's fun to dunk on him. Um, Anyways, one person who might have been holding this team back, and, and I was a big defender of him for his entire career, and, and I still believe in his talent, uh, but it was Steven Montez. Now, this is the reason I say this is because you watched the way that Sam Neuer reads the field. Uh, and this is something we've talked about all season with Drew Locke. Sam Neuer reads the field shallow to deep. If it's there for him easy, he wants to take it, and he will. And that gets the chains moving. And for a team that's going to be built upon running the ball, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Steven Montez, for all of his positive traits, had a big problem with reading the field deep to shallow. 
And what resulted was if it's not there deep, he's scrambling around and the play gets broken and, and you end up looking back at the film and you say, Katie Nixon was on a drag route wide open over the middle of the field. How did he miss that? That's not going to happen with Sam Neuer. And, you know, a lot of times you love to see the vertical passes getting hit because Steven Montez made a ton of huge plays in his career by hitting passes down the field. But when it comes to keeping your offense on the field, sometimes reading the defense shallow to deep is all you need. And I think Darren Cheverini, who a lot of people hated as an offensive coordinator, his first go around at this thing, showed tonight a quarterback who can read the field shallow to deep is, is a lot more beneficial to his offense. Yep. Yep. I agree. Um, plenty more to come, but want to give a quick shout out to Brackenridge Brewery. Uh, Brackenridge Brewery, incredible beers. If you guys haven't tried them yet, then you're totally missing out. Um, I didn't have any tonight because I I'm not used to like drinking during buffs games. Like to me, buffs yeah. is like work. And so I'm like tuned in with like my phone and my laptop and the iPad and just like totally just in my box. But now that we've kind of like moved past all of that and we're into this fun part, I do feel like I need a, a big strawberry sky to cap things off. Well, just to give people an idea of what we're going to be doing all season, normally these post-game shows are going to be from the DNVR bar uh, mm -hmm. and we'll be having some Breck Brews down there. I can promise you I will be having <laughs> Breck Brews during the game. You know, maybe you have to slow down. I'll be having plenty of Breck Brews during the game. We'd love – to have you guys come join us at the DNVR bar for these games moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll go upstairs and we'll hop on these post game shows afterwards tonight. We're remote, but uh, that's the, that's the plan moving forward is to drink Breck brews at the DNVR bar member size, 22 ounce Breck brews during the game, and then go do the post game show upstairs in the studio. I am so, so, so excited for that. Um, but yeah, Breckenridge beer is so good. Eight of them on tap at the DMVR bar. If you want to try a particular beer, I recommend the Strawberry Sky. You can get on the Breckenridge beer locator on the website. It'll tell you exactly where you can pick up that beer. And uh, you should do that. Also, want to give a shout out to DraftKings because they made tonight a whole lot of fun too. Uh I mean, it's been such a good day for me. It has been <laughs> such a good day for me. Uh, starting with Arizona State. Like, I literally put everything in the account on Arizona State because I was looking at that line. It's like, the, the, was it 12 points? It's just absurd. That game was a toss-up. Arizona State wound up losing at the end. Yeah, in a you want to hear something heartbreaking? Your boy had the money line. No. Yeah, like plus 335. I was so tempted and I think I even sent it in the group today. Like I was, I felt so responsible because I didn't even sprinkle did. the money line. You like like it. it was just the spread and that wound up hitting what could have been a big payday. Wouldn't have hit anyway. That is just the best feeling. Um, responsible gambling. And hopefully you guys are partaking as well. But if you aren't, now is the time to jump onto DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of DNVR. So many great offers, so many great boosts. You really should check them out. Um, and the best is that all new users are covered up to $100. And that's right. If you make your bet uh, tomorrow on Sunday, uh, you'll get site credits in return for any of your bets that don't hit up to $100 if you are a new user. So make sure you take advantage of that. Uh, you can download the top rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code DNVR when you sign up to get this can't miss offer, which is that DraftKings Sportsbook is ensuring your Sunday bets up to $100. That's right. You bet they cover up to $100 when you use promo code DNVR during sign up for a limited time only at DraftKings Sport Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Colorado only, risk free coverage paid out in site credits. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 522 4700. Speaking of uh, DraftKings. Speaking of DraftKings. Something that we're going to be doing throughout this entire season is our draft king of the game. And uh, I'm sure you guys can guess who the draft king of the game was tonight. That's uh, that's Jarek Broussard, who just mm. went off Crowded. 31 carries, 187 yards, three touchdowns, uh, six yards per carry, an incredible night. Uh, and I believe that we have Ben back with us after talking with a whole bunch of buffs. 
Yes, I'm back. How you all doing? We're doing uh, great. Yeah. One second. I got to go put on this uh, Clemson-Notre Dame game on my TV because it is going into double overtime, according to our guy, Colorado wow. Trav, in the, uh, in the uh, mentions here. Okay. Well, I can't blame you for that one. Um Ben, you haven't had, oh, I should say, if you guys have any questions, any comments, throw those in the comments for this thing that's happening here, this post-game live stream. You can do it on Periscope through Twitter. You can put it on uh, the uh, YouTube as well, which is where we really recommend that you go because you can subscribe. You can see everything like pop up as soon as it happens. And if you are on YouTube, give us like likes and stuff because that really does matter. Um, but Ben, you didn't get a chance to share all of your th feelings about Jarek Broussard. So uh, the stage is yours. Well, I mean, I, I don't even know where to start, really. You look at that, you know, six yards per carry, 31 carries, really a workhorse. Uh, he, he jumped on the podium in that press conference and, you know, a lot of shades of Philip Lindsay wearing that 23. But one thing that I did notice is he is not as outspoken. He's kind of a mild mannered guy when he was up there. And, you know, he talked about the O-line and he just simply said, shout out to my hogs. If, if a hole's not that big it's, or if a hole's that big, it's, it's not that hard to run through. I mean, he, he really was just confident in his offensive line, confident in his ability. Uh, he did everything that, you know, you would hope for to see out of him, you know, seeing how, how tightly touted he was. But stepping in for Alex Fontenot, I mean, I don't know that anybody really could have expected that type of performance, but his vision, his cuts – his ability to turn a negative play into a positive play was eye-opening. And, you know, you feel bad for a guy like Alex Fontenot. Carl Durrell touched on it a little bit. They said they're hopeful that he'll return for this week. But, you know, you just got to imagine they're going to ride the, the hot hand and, and keep feeding Jarek. You have to. You really do have to. And it it's just so much fun to see. And like you're saying, like, he is not the most outspoken guy. He actually talked to the media maybe for the first time in his career – definitely like the first time at the podium um, this week about everything. And you realize it's like, he's not used to this. Like this is new. And so it's going to be really fun to watch him kind of build and develop. You know, it was only like 24 hours ago. I was sitting right here recording the pregame pod and saying like the one area where I'm trying my best to temper my expectations is with Jarek because throughout camp, Darren Cheverini said that he's uh, the best high school zone runner he's ever seen. Darian Hagen saying that he's the most or the he has the a type of ability that the buffs haven't had in a decade. And it's been really high praise. And to see him just totally live up to it, so nice. Yeah, he was awesome. I mean, he was fantastic. He looked like a former 23 uh that used to put on the black and gold. Like it, and Phil tweeted out. Uh, even there's a new 23 in town, which like is so great. So many times you see guys get salty about players wearing their numbers, um, which I'm like, dude, they have like a hundred people on the team. Everyone's number is going to get worn. Um, so I just love the fact that he had a running back out there, put on the 23, be a shifty, tough to tackle, tough runner. Uh, you know, he was small, but he, he was a, a hoss out there. He was running over dude. So just, I mean, just awesome to see. So freaking awesome to see. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, Ben, I'm just curious to hear, like, what were the main takeaways from the press conferences? What did we, what did we learn? What, how did Carl sound? Was he stoked? Like, what did we hear? Carl was as mild mannered as I think he's always been. He, he really wasn't too high. wasn't too low. Um, he was asked a lot about what it was like to go up against his former team and, you know, how those emotions felt. And he was very honest. He said, I wasn't emotional until, you know, I saw our players win and, and I felt good for them. And I think that speaks volumes to him as a leader in, you know, what they really brought him in to do, which was to write the ship after Mel Tucker ran away, you know, at midnight, that, that solemn February night. And, you know, Darrell was really here to, to write that ship to, put his players first into, you know, really emphasize that development. He, as well as um, you know, Darian Rakeshaw, they both were on the podium talking about the defense and they did not sound too concerned about it, which I thought was interesting. Darian in particular, they said they had a couple of corrections and just a couple of assignments, but he made notes several times that it was nothing major, which to me was, you know, a little bit surprising because it seemed like they had a cover zero wide open tight end over the middle on four or five different plays there. But 
you know, a lot of times they all were just touching on, you know, it's a great win, but we're ready to get back to work, which I think is a great attitude to have. They put up 48 points. It was a fun victory. I'm sure they had a lot of that pent up emotion from the off season, even though they really didn't talk about it. Again, they just took it as a business as usual attack. Um, but, you know, they, they had a good mentality. It sounded like, a, you know, enjoy the win right now. Get back to work tomorrow. Uh, that wasn't cover zero. That was cover negative one. <laughs> um, like cover zero, you're supposed to still have all the receivers manned up. Yeah, I, I, so many times I'm, I'm sitting there and they're getting tons of pressure up the middle. But how many times did TTR just fade backwards and you're like, oh, this is going to be intercepted? You know, he's fading off his back foot, lobbing it up, and then you realize there's nobody home. You know, and and I think that's has to be a point of emphasis for the defense. It's something that I made note of is Mustafa Johnson and company. They're getting a lot of pressure up the middle. But their outside pass rushers were not containing well. And, you know, they escape with the win here, and that's fine. But as you both know, and I'm, as I'm sure the, the viewers know, Arizona State, Jaden Daniels, he ran for over 100 yards, you know. And so this defense still gives you the, the nightmares of Khalil Tate with Arizona. If they cannot find a way to stop mobile quarterbacks from escaping the pocket and running all over them. Yeah, it sucks. It's really tough to defend a guy like that. It's going to be really tough to defend a guy like Jaden Daniels. Um, I, you know, they. I love the idea of bringing pressure. Um, I talked about it all week. Is you know, you don't necessarily have the guys to cover and coverage anyway. So just bring pressure and try to throw quarterbacks off. The problem is when you get a guy like DTR, when you get a guy like Jaden Daniels, bringing pressure doesn't always help you. Um, because they can escape and there's going to be an open receiver somewhere and those guys are built to make those plays. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a tough to thing, but, but like I said, you love to win and learn lessons. You win and learn lessons. And when you learn lessons, when you win, you feel a hell of a lot better. And to be honest, the players take to the lessons a lot easier. You know, like those players are going to be listening more intently right now. Like they, like they still believe they can go undefeated. And because of that, everything that happens this week uh, is going to mean more from the coaches. So um, it, it was bad. I mean, two different times where you literally you recover negative one. You brought more people than they had receivers. Um, you can't ever do that. Uh, but hopefully they learn their lesson and, and get better next week. Yeah, I, I could not tell you guys how many times in the first two months, three months of last season, I guess the whole season's only three months, so like two months of last season, either Mel Tucker or Tyson Summers said something along the lines of, well, if you take away the big plays, if you take away their three 20 plus yard gains, we actually held them to 2.8 yards per play, which is under the three, which is our goal. And, and just over and over and over. It's like, we're just letting a couple of things leak through. And so it does scare me to hear that they're saying, it's not that big a deal. They're small mistakes. And yeah, they're small mistakes, but you really cannot afford any mistakes with this football team where it's at. You know, you aren't Alabama yet. You aren't Clemson yet. You did a lot of good things, but this is a middle of the pack, Pac-12 team, if if things go the way that I think that they probably will this year. And speaking of Clemson, <laughs> they lost. <laughs> and uh, Notre Dame fans rushed the field which is uh, not something I expected to see this season. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to do that. You're not I supposed can't to believe how many you know, people it, were there. Uh, I, I don't know. But I, I saw, like, I think it was uh, Brian Howell tweeted, like, that Pat Rooney said something up in the press box about there being, like, a field storm tonight. And that was one of the moments where I was like, oh, this just kind of sucks that I'm not there hearing all the jokes of the conversation. But uh, a field storm. That's a... Uh, not something I would have expected. Back That's to yikes. uh, yikes. The, yeah, you can't justify that. You did beat number one, but yeah, it's not worth it. Um, I can't believe. I mean, like it. It doesn't look any different than a normal. Like, like the field is full of people. Like, I can't believe there were that many people in the stands in the first place. The Buffs had what a thousand people there today. The I think official attendance was like five hundred and fifty. Five hundred. I I did see that five fifty. That's uh. <laughs> Wow. Look, I, I see Andre Simone shouting me out in the chat there. Brian Kelly, I don't care that he pulled up the upset. Brian Kelly is still a bum. He burned my Bearcats back in 2009, and he burned them again because if they would have lost, the Bearcats could have snapped up into the top four. So that puts a damper on my night a little bit, I'll be honest. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, Notre Dame rarely lives up to the hype. They got lucky that they didn't have to face Trevor Lawrence. I believe that. They did. And it's disappointing because I really want to see BYU get in. That's a really fun team. But now that Notre Dame has this win, I think that unless something crazy happens, they're probably in. Well, we can do that math later. But the Buffs defense, we've been talking about the big plays, and that's a problem. But one of the things that I kind of want your guys' thoughts on is Christian Gonzalez. You know, he's out there as a true freshman, had like the ankle thing really quickly, um, came back to play. The two pass interference calls are probably what he's going to get remembered for tonight. But did you guys see anything that really jumped out to you in a positive way? Uh, yeah, I love the fact that he was in position. Um, you know, I, I saw a lot of fans like losing their minds, and it's like, look, man, this kid's a freshman. He mm -hmm. has things to learn. That like this is how it works. He has to learn things, and uh, the fact that he's in position to make the play is a fantastic thing. Um, he just needs to learn to get his head around. And, th like, these things happen. You know, Ken Crawley, when he was at CU, who, you know, eventually went on to play in the NFL, had the exact same problem. And eventually, he, he figured it out. It took him a long time, and hopefully it doesn't take Christian Gonzalez nearly as long. But when you're there, the, getting there is the first step. Now, you have to trust your instincts and get your head around because it's scary to take your eyes off of the guy you're trying to cover because, you know, if you do that and you miss, it's probably going to be a touchdown. So it's just – it's like learning to snowboard and, and trying to learn how to go toe edge. Like, you got to take your eyes off the downhill part of snowboarding, which is scary. Uh, and it's just – over time, you start to trust yourself. And so eventually Christian Gonzalez will get to the place where he trusts himself to be in position and make the plays. But this is what happens when you start freshmen in the secondary. They're just scared to screw up. Yeah, and, and I also think, too, I mean, UCLA knew that they were going against a, a freshman cornerback. They're going to pick on him a little bit more than an experienced veteran, and I think that's good. I think that's good, especially because this year you're not losing that eligibility, so you can get a guy like Christian Gonzalez out there, and he can go through his rookie bumps in a season where the expectations are already so astronomically low that you really don't have anything to lose. I think that second defensive pass interference – I think it was fantastic coverage, and it was an underthrown ball that aided in the fact that he was right there. So I think he got a little bit unlucky in that regard. But, yes, he needs to work on getting his head around. He got also bailed out uh, on that post route uh, over the middle because the receiver dropped it too. There Again, there's flashes. And I think that's what you need to buy into is, is there's flashes from this guy. We also don't know if, if he's fully healthy because he did have that non-contact injury early in the first quarter where he came up a little bit lame on that ankle. So we don't even know if, you know, he might've been playing a little bit hurt throughout the rest of that game. Yeah. Spending so much time watching college secondaries, it does seem like this is a very common problem. You know, it even happened in the game with the Buffs tonight, not just with Christian Gonzalez, but with Isaiah Lewis on a, that uh, it was a 41 yard third down conversion pass, like down the middle. And Isaiah Lewis is right there just didn't make a play on the ball. You know, it's a complaint that we had about KJ Trujillo uh, quite often last year as well. Another true freshman who's on the field was a backup tonight, which just kind of goes to show where the Buffs DBs are at, which is a crazy turnaround from a year ago when they were having guys change positions just to get bodies back there. But that's going to be the separator. Like, like if Christian Gonzalez can start making those plays, then yeah, he's going to be a lockdown corner on that side. And I think that'd be great. Um, and I think that it's going to happen. Um, we've got helmet stickers coming up. Also, if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. We'll get to both of those things after I tell you guys about this awesome thing that's happening at DNVR this weekend. You guys still have about 24 hours to get in to the election open, which is the WGT World Golf Tour uh, event that DNVR is hosting. Um, it's your civic it's duty. Of, your civic duty. Very true to play in this golf tournament. I thought this is a big week for civic duty. I feel yeah. like I don't have civic duties more than like, honestly, voting. It's like once every <laughs> four years. And now my plate's a little bit full, if I'm being honest. I don't know. Back to WGT, though. Uh, World Golf Tour is an incredible game. Uh, it's played by over 20 million people worldwide. You can play it on your iPhone, your tablet, uh, on your desktop browser. 
Um, and it really is great. There's so many game modes. You can play top golf. You can play closest to the pin, stroke play, skins. You can play with your friends. You can play with random people. Uh, you can go play at Beth Page Black or St. Andrews or Bandon Dunes, wherever you want to go. And like I said, this is a special weekend at WGT. Well, I guess through DNVR um, because that election open is happening. Um, and if you guys play uh, congressional, the the golf course, you can uh, screenshot that you played it in the closest to the pin and send that in to, uh, I believe, the help at the DMVR.com uh, email. Just, just tweet or, it at us. Just tweet, or it, tweet at it at us. us. Yeah, most of you guys are on Twitter. I actually can't find the read still on the read page. Um, but yeah, uh, WGT, join us. Go to WG, or DMVRgolf.com. You can get yourself into the DNVR three country club uh, where you can play golf with us. And we're having a lot of fun. So do that. Um, helmet stickers. Yes. Time to give out our uh, player of the game awards. Um, can you imagine how can... cool it would be if we put the little DNVR buffs logo on the helmets as a helmet wow. sticker? Someday. <laughs> I think there's they a brand like partnership that. there somewhere. We need to, we need to get with their people. I agree. I agree. Oh, the email's info at ddmvr.com, by the way. Um, but uh, helmet stickers, uh, where do we start? Um, ben, you go first. Give out a helmet sticker to somebody who you think is deserving. I don't want to. I don't want to beat a dead horse here. I'm going to assume you guys talked everybody's ear off about Sam Neuer to start the show, but I think you have to start there. Um, in in his presser, he made a specific way to go out of his way to shout out his time learning under Cepho and Steven called them great quarterbacks, how he could learn a lot. And I, it really took me back when I heard that quote, because it really put into perspective how long he's been here and, and, and how long he's in the program. You know, a lot of people reference presidential administrations when they try and make something sound a whole lot older than it is. And when he said, you know, learning under Cepho, again, it really took me back. He stepped up, I thought he went through his progressions way better than I think anybody would have anticipated. He made some big time throws and also, you know, he overcame some adversity. I know Arias had a couple of drops. He also had a, a couple, I think it was one or two drops by Russell as well. So, so he was able to overcome a lot of those, you know, little adversity. And when you talk about a game where you put up 48 points, it might be nitpicky to, to outline those things, but those are areas where the offense can get better, but it's a place where Sam still played great. I think he also had, a really great pocket awareness. And, you know, I also want to touch on his athleticism. That really changes the bus offense. That's something that Steven Montez showed random flashes of wild athleticism, and then he would come back to earth with like a paltry two-yard run. Sam Neuer, they really designed this offense around him, played to his strengths, and it just really gets you excited to see not only what he can do for the rest of this year, but also, again, going back to that eligibility thing, if he plays good enough and he wants to stick around, they can keep playing into this offense for another year. So I think you have to start with QB1. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, I think those are great points. And just because we haven't talked about the athleticism compared to Steven all that much, but that was like a storyline with Steven was we know that he can run the ball. He just doesn't really do it. And I think the difference is now having seen Sam Neuer in that same offense, Sam's just built for it. Like if Steven was running, it would feel like his legs aren't like thick enough or something like for some reason, his body just doesn't seem like it's meant to take hits. Whereas Sam just knows how to run behind his pads. Yes, absolutely. Running behind the pads is, is huge. You saw him like breaking tackle. He's running people over yeah. out there. And like, that's when you saw like, Oh, right. This guy was a safety. You know, mm -hmm. everyone wants to talk about that as a bad thing. It's like the most classic dunk on Sam Neuer. Like he played safety. It's like, okay, get over it. He's the quarterback now. And I like a quarterback that plays like a safety. Now I do, I do think he's too important um, to put his body on the line like that. All of a sudden in one game, he's become that, but you know what? If he's going to go out there and run people over, I'm going to get hyped every single time he does it. Yep. Yeah. And, and um, real quick, too, with that point, um, he, he talked about that in his presser, too. Uh, you know, they highlighted a couple times in the broadcast of how, you know, Chef called him in the offseason to get him to stay, that they wanted him. And Sam Neuer noted that they said they wanted to use his legs. They said they had a plan for it, and that's what they wanted to do. And I think that is the biggest 
you know, vote of confidence you can have in a guy, not just that he has the athleticism, but that your coaching staff buys in and is willing to use those strengths. He also did touch on how he took a took a few too many hits. A lot of people also point out that, you know, that dig in the shoulder he had, I think it was in the, the second half, kind of an awkward looking fall. So he needs to work on, you know, when to, you know, plow people over as a safety and when also to realize you're the starting quarterback. But yeah really impressed with his ability to use that athleticism to his advantage. Is that comment about Neuer? Did he have a brace on after the game? He didn't, he didn't touch on it. He said he felt fine. All the guys talked about how they felt fine. They he, every single person who's on that podium said, well, I feel a little nicked up, but we're okay. So yeah, I don't think I, I didn't hear anything about that. Yeah, exactly. Um, my helmet stickers, I'm going to cheat here and just give one to the entire offensive line. William Sherman, Kerry Cush. Colby Purcell, Casey Roddick, Frank Phillip, all of those guys. Just slap them on there. If I miss anyone, you can correct me, Henry. Um, I but think Josh Gines got in at center for a bit. But yeah, good for like give him one too. Um, they went out there and and they won the football game. Like those guys won the football game. You win the trenches, you win the football game. They won it on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, a lot of times they had lost it on the defensive side of the ball. They got pushed around a little bit at times there. Um, but I, I, they did get penetration late, which was huge. You win You win the trenches, you win the football game. You win the turnover battle, you win the football game. Um, they won the trenches, and it was awesome. Like As much as I want to see a lot of points, which they still got tonight, um, mm-hmm. the identity of Colorado football teams that have been great is running the ball. And it's a, it's something that's true of almost all of the great Colorado football teams we've ever seen. And be, to do that, you have to dominate the trenches. Uh, and those guys did it tonight. So each and every one of them, a couple of mistakes here and there, they get a helmet sticker for me. That's a good one. And, you know, I actually tweeted early in the game something about how it seems like half the time they're just bowling over the UCLA defensive line. And half the time there's just like, two guys in the backfield that got cleaned up really quickly, really quickly. It seemed like they really kind of just sharpened up, you know, beginning of the game. I thought all over that offense, there were just a couple of like little problems. You know, it seemed like when they put Maurice bell in motion, for example, the timing wasn't quite right to fake the jet sweep and those sorts of things that you just expect to, to see have issues early in the season. Um, Wow, so many players to choose from, though. Oh, let's start with Dimitri Stanley. Mm. Beginning of the game, that man was everywhere. He just dominated the middle of the field in the way you want a slot receiver to. And I wanted to give it to Brady Russell. I think he's deserving of a helmet sticker as well. That's really where I was torn offensively. Um, But for the same reason, because those two work together to really make the middle of the field work in a way that that typically hasn't for the buffs in the past. Like it doesn't seem like they've been able to take advantage of the same things that they did tonight. And UCLA's linebackers aren't good. Like that's just something that we know coming into this game. That's one of the weakest units on that team, but they took advantage of it and you got to give them props for it. Yeah. uh, It's your podcast center. So you're allowed to just give as many helmet stickers as you want, but since you didn't, I'll give one to Brady Russell. Um, I mean, He's just Mr. Reliable out there. You saw Sam Neuer in big moments in the game look to him. He dropped two passes. You hate to see that, but uh, he'll be he'll be right back there. He'll and and he'll make those plays next week. He's trustworthy for uh, you know the quarterback. He's more athletic than he gets credit for because he's a big old white guy with long hair and it just doesn't look like he should be athletic. But he is athletic. He gets a touchdown tonight. He is a great. Buff. He cares about the university. He cares about his teammates. He's uh, he's everything you want for. And I think that before his career is over, he will win a Buffalo Heart Award. So the verse, the least I can give him is a helmet sticker tonight. Yeah, I mean, everybody talks about how a tight end is going to be your quarterback's best friend, especially a young quarterback getting his first start. And he went to him early and often, which is is really a sign of that connection. It should only grow to get better. Um, I'm going to go to the other side of the ball which is, you know, a little tough considering they gave up 42 points. But initially, I got to give the helmet sticker to Nate Landman. And the reason I'm going to give one to Nate Landman really derives on one quote from Darren Rakestraw and his presser afterwards. He said, regarding that fourth down, late in that fourth quarter, Nate Landman on the sideman said, I'm going to go out there and make a play. And he did just that. 
he stuffed the hole exactly how you wanted to. And you really felt that, you know, you felt that hit. It wasn't anything that, you know, jarred the ball loose or anything, but getting that turnover, getting that turnover on downs and giving the ball back to your offense, because this was a game where realistically the bus defense had to say, if we give the ball back to the offense, we're going to run down there and score a touchdown. You know, that's how this game felt. And so they just needed to get a stop to make sure that the bus put up just enough points to keep them out of range. And, you know, Nate Lehman did just that. He he did a great job of, you know, just being that enforcer. You know, he, he's a stereotypical middle linebacker wearing that neck roll. He's a fierce guy, and he went in there, and he really controlled that trench. Yeah, and I'm not surprised to hear that he said that. Like, that is a very Nate Landman thing to say on the sideline. He has kind of grown into this personality that really fits a really good linebacker. You know, things like, I think I might have said this on one of the podcasts at some point, but uh, the last time we talked to him, I think it was probably Monday or Tuesday of this week, um, after he walked off, one of the SIDs <laughs> got on the Zoom call and said, yeah, Right after Nate took the headset off, he said he's not talking to the media after the game unless he leads the team in tackles. And, you know, it's just like that kind of stuff where he knows what he's capable of. He knows that he can put the team on his back. And a couple of important moments tonight, he did. Um, I'll give one out on the defensive side of the ball too. Uh, Mustafa Johnson. It's He's an interesting player because at points during the game, I I found myself thinking, if only he were just a little bit faster. If he was just a little bit faster, once he gets through that line of scrimmage, he would be getting sacks constantly. But that's not his role. You know, there are very few guys that do have like that Chris Jones, Aaron Donald type of athleticism to go do that. His job is to tee things up for the other pass rushers. And as Ben noted earlier, they just didn't quite bring things home. But Mustafa was incredibly productive tonight. Um, and most of that defensive line really did hold, like live up to the hype that we've been hearing about them. And I'm really excited about that. I think the defensive line got you like 95% of the way there, but it just left enough of that taste in your mouth where you wanted more. You know, it, the pressure was constant. It was consistent. But, you know, only coming up with Mustafa, only coming up with one sack. I really think that number is going to be higher moving forward when you go against a less mobile guy. Because, again, DTR, we talked about it. He is not your average quarterback. He is so athletic and electric on the field. But I, I completely agree. Mustafa Johnson really anchors that, you know, front four. And that front seven, I think, is going to improve steadily moving forward. They did a good job trying to, you know, control the run game. But, UCLA just has a lot of playmakers that are just fast, you know, moving across the ball. And, and when you kind of are shifting and you're doing a lot of those motions and stuff, it's tough for guys like Mustafa Johnson to continue to, you know, make an impact in the stat sheet. But he definitely passed the eye test. Yep. Um, I, I think that's it for helmet stickers. We've all done I mean, two. You, we could give out a million. Like I know, Carl Terrell I know. deserves one for his first win. Uh, Darren Cheverini deserves one for calling a they great game. Helmets, they can, so they can have hat <laughs> stickers um, okay. uh, or mask stickers. Um, mm, get, I, get, I yeah. give Carl Terrell a sticker for keeping his mask on the whole game. Um, that, you that's know, There's plenty of guys who deserve it out there. I thought um, Maurice Bell made some big plays for the team. Um, mm -hmm. you, 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 like you can go through, I mean, uh, uh Joe Davis, is that his name? Yeah. It's a big, big, big <laughs> day. It's a, it, it's a big year for Joe's, uh, just in general. Um, you, Joe Burrow, Joe Biden, Joe Davis, um, like, mm -hmm. you know, he made big plays, uh, or not big plays, but he had one really good run. I mean, everyone on the offense, I don't think there's anyone on the mm -hmm. offense who doesn't deserve one. Erden Rice, yeah. I guess, only made one catch. But uh, as a true freshman in his yeah, first yeah, game, yeah. he's out there with a really deep group of receivers. I'm sure they don't have Katie Nixon, but still, even the fact that he's on the field at this point is impressive. But you know, Darian Rakestra knocking the ball out, recovering the fumble at the start of the game that really got everything rolling. Um, and then he he just about had another forced fumble later on. I I can't remember if that ended up standing or not, but but uh, uh, and then uh, Carson uh, Wells he he had the uh, uh, interception just about had a second interception. I mean, there were a lot of great performances tonight. And I think that that's, 
those are all good reasons to think that the Buffs are going to be able to keep this up. You know, you look at the schedule. You took care of business against UCLA. You got to take care of business against Arizona. And then if you can steal one of the other four, I think that Stanford is a great opportunity next week. This is a bowl team. Hey, uh, keep it rolling. You know, like, I just want everyone to be patient. Um, it's just, there's so many young players. There's so many difficult obstacles that this team had to overcome. I'm so elated that they're one to know. It feels amazing. You know, let's not forget that uh, the Dan Hawkins era started with the loss to Montana state and the Don Embry era early on had a loss to Sacramento state. Um, There have been really, really bad starts to coaching careers. Now, um, Mel Tucker started his career with wins over CSU and Nebraska. I don't know if anyone can beat that, but it feels good. Like to win a conference game for Carl Durrell in his first game as the head coach at CU should not be just looked at as a small thing. Uh, that was a big win, and it it means a lot. It means a lot for a coach to go out there and do that. As many of these Pac-12 wins as you can stack up is huge as he goes into you know to a living room to try and recruit these players and show that they're building something here. Um, I, uh, I'm really happy for him. And I got big time Gary Barnett vibes from him tonight. Um, you know, he's not going to get too high. He's not going to get too low. He knows a hell of a lot about football. He's going to have his team well-prepared, ready to play. Uh, and I loved that about him tonight. So it was a really, really great and important start to his career here. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I think that's going to do it for tonight. Uh, Before you do, we should take some questions uh, from the people in the comments. Okay. That's a good one. Isaiah Lewis, you know, there has been buzz. And what we've been told about Isaiah Lewis is that he is the backup. You know, if if something happens to Darian Rakestraw, something happens to Chris Miller, like is what happened tonight. If something happens to Mark Perry, Isaiah Lewis is the veteran who knows every position and they trust to go out there and do whatever job needs to be done. Um, and looking at what he did tonight through that lens, I, I think that that really is the perfect role for him. I, I think that the, having a good player who is a bench player is something that can only help this defense. And I think it's one of those missing pieces really. And I think too, you know, his, you talk about his leadership too, what he can bring of, of having kind of like that six man who's able to come in, in in key situations. I look at that fourth down play in the fourth quarter and the buffs are kind of scrambling to do a substitution and they're not set. They're not ready. And Isaiah Lewis is one of those guys that's just, going like this to the sideline he knew immediately like this is not going to work let's burn a timeout let's not try and push this you know this is an important play and I think having a guy with that kind of situational awareness on the field is super important in in a role like that somebody who can see the play clock and kind of have that role as a safety and just be able to make sure everyone's in the right position especially on those key plays he should have had a pick uh, and Mm -hmm. that would have made his night even better Uh, I thought he looked great out there yeah um next one here yeah there you go oh is this going to be an offensive team or an outlier game because we played ucla um that's a really good question but what i will say is that the strength of this defense is supposed to be that defensive line you know with osa odigizua in the middle there um, he was the one who had like the weird play where he just kind of like ran through into the pocket untouched and just jumped around instead of sacking Sam Neuer. But having him there with a couple of other solid players around him, it's not a great defensive line by any means. It's a, it's a solid group. And the fact that the bus were able to push them around the way that they did, that's a really good sign. You look at the corners, you look at the linebackers, and there really isn't all that much to get excited about. And that's where you do need to see just a little bit more. But what we did see from Sam Neuer is that he was able to hit some tight windows. I I think the the drop from Daniel Arias stands out. There was uh, one to Brady Russell that was, I think that I tweeted something about that being like a big boy throw. You know, he can hit the tight windows, even if the windows weren't as tight as they might be going forward. Um, I'm bought in on the odds. 
Yeah, I, I am too. And, and it's interesting because coming into this game, the offense is the thing that I was most, I don't want to say concerned about, but interested in because obviously without having the media availability to see the practices and really only hearing about what's going on through the Zoom lens, uh, you know, s- just so many question marks going into it. Um, going back to, to, you know, talking about Daniel Arias, we mentioned not sure how many guys on that offense don't deserve a helmet sticker. I think Daniel Arias has a lot of work to do, a lot of offseason hype. And I was I was a little disappointed um, because he's he's that big body guy. He's really got to take advantage of the plays when they come his way. He did capitalize on that post route over the middle for about 30 yards, but he's got to improve in that way. But but yeah, Sam Neuer showed tonight. He can play with the big boys. He's not a safety who's here just trying to run some triple option gadget offense. He's a quarterback. And so the defense, I think, is going to improve a little bit more as, as time goes on because we saw that same trajectory last year. They The defense did not start off last season well, but then they were able to gradually get better. And then you look to that Washington game in November when they really stood out. They had that kind of coming out game. You were hoping that that momentum would carry into this season. Took a step back, but I'm still optimistic. But, yeah, I mean, in the Pac-12, after what we saw this morning, too, and, and who knows what Washington State's going to do tonight, this really could be just, you know, shootout after shootout, week after week. Absolutely. Henry, I have a question for you. Um, okay. I think a lot of people are probably dumping on board right now. You know, the, it, there was a, such a lame lead-up to this season i think a lot of people probably the first time they thought about the buffs is when they put on the game tonight um what do you think of arizona coming up this next week in the schedule as a whole and after seeing the buffs play how do you feel about their chances to you know uh to win next week first and foremost uh and then uh you know win a couple more games after that it's actually Stanford this week, which is something that I've oh, been sorry, saying yeah, wrong. Yeah, I, no, I, I think say, I probably I say Arizona. Yeah, okay, my bad. But I I had been saying that for a while too. Um, but Stanford though, he, well, the the big question honestly is what's up at quarterback? Like Davis Mills is supposed to be the guy. He looked good last year. He didn't play tonight, and I don't think we have any COVID. reason why. COVID. It was it COVID. So yeah. I mean, if it's COVID, then you can probably. Can you assume? We'll I, I think we'll you could probably assume he's not there next week. And that's something that you have to really like in like the way that you're allowed to like, just like the matchup and not what's happening to the man. But with no quarterback there with Cameron Scarlett, that big bulky running back gone, it's not an offense that I'm super excited to see. You know, the offensive line is solid. They have some good players. Um, but UCLA is a much more dynamic offense, especially if Davis Mills isn't there. Defensively, they're all right. They don't have Paulson Adebo playing this year, the the cornerback who's really the star of that defense. This is a very winnable game. I mean, there's a reason why what happened last year happened. Um, I'm, I actually haven't checked this score recently. I guess it's over. 35-14, Oregon beat them. It was a little bit close in the beginning. I've only been watching the scores. I haven't seen the game. But this is certainly a winnable game. It's great. Uh, I mean, you look at the, you look at the schedule, uh, you know, Stanford, winnable. ASU, they looked really good for 58 minutes today. Yeah, um, that's a good football team. So they're not bad. Uh, USC, they looked kind of bad for 58 minutes today, but they ended up <laughs> pulling it out in the end. Uh, Arizona, definitely a winnable game in Utah. We don't really know yet. Um, probably going to be tough. Always pretty tough. So, I don't know. Like you, After you watch that team play, again, I don't want people to put unfair expectations on this team. But after you watch that team play tonight, I feel like you should, you should feel like you can be in each and every one of these games. I totally agree. And one area, too, I mean, the Buffs left 12 points on the board tonight from special teams errors. And I think that that's something that is equally a little bit frightening and equally optimistic because, you know, those having two blocked kicks or was it three? No, it was two blocks, you know, in one game. I mean, that's just kind of unlikely. You don't expect that to continue. At least you hope you don't expect that to continue. Um, to Durrell on the switch from Stefano to Evan Price. He said that there was a little bit of a nick with James. That was his quote. And he said that it was enough of an issue that they felt they needed a change. So it's a little bit interesting because James Stefano 
A lot of hype. He's a great kicker. Um, interesting that they had him take that you know 51 yard or when they could have gone for it uh, in, in the first half. But a, that's 12 points that if you have back, I mean, this is what 60 points of a night. And, you know, so, so that's an area when you play some harder teams, when you look at, you know, the, the rest of the schedule, that's an area where this team could improve on and, and help out. All right. Um, let's fly through these questions. Uh, thoughts on Mangum seemed really limited and very quiet when he was involved. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of where we're at. I think that with this group of running backs, there's probably a more dynamic option at this point. I will point. say, I'm can not I just jump in? That. I yeah. think they need to use him like a power back. Um, if you want to, ha you know, he needs to be the thunder to the lightning. And so I, he's not that great on outside stretch plays. Now I think he has a good cut and he has good vision, but I want to see him, you know, get Brady Russell in the backfield as a, as a fullback and run Jaron Mangum behind him. Like, you know, let him be a power back. See if you can get him going downhill. If you're trying to get him going east-west, he's not going to be nearly as effective as a guy like Broussard. Uh, but I think you can find better ways to utilize his skill set. Agreed. Any quick thoughts, Ben, or should we keep going? Oh, there we go. How do you allocate the carries when Fontenot comes back? Ooh. That's Game one that he's back, it's 50-50 to me. 50-50 to me. Too, too many for Fontenot. It's 60-40 really? at least for Broussard uh, until he shows you that he shouldn't be the number one back. Like, I mean, this wasn't just like a good game. This was the second best uh, – or this was the best debut by a Colorado running back since 1973. So, like, this wasn't just like, you know, oh, the guy came in and filled in well. This was like, oh, that's a number one running back in the Pac-12. So – you hate to say it because Alex Fontenot has been a good player for this team, but you know, he got swoops tonight. And so when he's back, he's going to have to, you know, it's, it's Broussard's job to lose in my opinion. Broussard had 180 yards and it wasn't just off of a couple pops. I mean, 31 carries shows you he's a bell cow. Six yards per carry shows you that he's able to work between the tackles. And, and again, his vision and his patience, as well as that jump cut, was so impressive. I mean, you can't, you know, you got to feed the hot hand. If Jarek, you know, comes back next week and shows that this was just a flash in the pan, then yeah, you can start to shift those carries back. But if the buffs are smart, you feed Jarek Broussard until it does not go any further. I'm with you. Uh, look to the future. Are these Mel Tucker guys with a good season? Can we recruit? Um, you know, it was actually kind of crazy. I went back through the 24 seven sports puts together like their rankings based on star talent on the roster. And in the pack 12 UCLA is sixth and Colorado is eighth. But when you look through the players, their top rated recruits out of high school on their roster right now, five of the six of them are, are freshmen, which is just crazy to think about the future going forward. Um, but I do think that you can recruit. I, I think that you have to be able to recruit when you get a win like this. I think that you really have to sell the coaching staff to these guys. And what we've heard is that like, you know, from Taylor Embry, for example, the tight ends coach, somebody who I have very high feelings toward <laughs> that worked out. Um, but, but he, uh, yeah. he, he said that the guy him too. who really appreciate what he's done in the NFL with George Kittle, those are the guys who know football and those are the guys he wants anyway. And I think that's what you're going to see is maybe you're not just getting like the pure like speed, whatever, but I think you're going to get a lot of really good football players who understand what Colorado did tonight and has the potential to do going forward. Yeah, I think this coaching staff is top to bottom. It's it's thorough. It's got a lot of knowledge. And, you know, it, again, I'm going to keep coming back to it, utilizing your guys to their skill sets. The play calling tonight, I thought was as close to flaw. I, I, I thought Darren Shiverini had as close to a flawless play calling game as I have seen in a long time. It was just really impressive. This coaching staff knows what they're doing, and that's how you can sell it to these recruits. And you can use games like this. You win 
not necessarily a shootout, but I mean, you win a big game against UCLA. These are, these are, you know, not necessarily the brick games that Colorado has, but stuff that you can lean on to show that this coaching staff knows what they're doing and is building a promising program. Uh, are you watching you SNL go. after this? I, I haven't missed an episode of SNL in like years. Like really, maybe, you're in a, a big SNL guy. Yeah, maybe back before like college. I've missed like a I bunch mean, of them live and have to go back, but excited for that tonight. Chappelle hosting SNL is uh is can't miss TV. Yep. Defensive problems fixable, you think? Uh yeah, I, I think so because we saw the buffs fix these same problems last year. The question to me is how long is it going to take? And to me, it's really on Nate and it's on Tyson Summers. Those are the two who have gone through this, who really understand what this defense is supposed to be. And they just need to stop the mistakes. You know, for most of the game, the defense was really good. There was just like the five or six plays where they really weren't. And plays like a tight end just being totally wide open, nobody within 20 yards of them. That's just a blown assignment. It is very obvious what that was. You just need guys to stop blowing their assignments. Yeah. And I'm not sure how long that'll take to fix. Yeah, that that is my point. When you look at a schedule like this, I mean, there's only five more regular season games, which is a it's it's so interesting to think about as as how long and, and how long is it gonna take for Tyson Summers to rally his guys to fix this? Because when you're looking at a shortened season like this, obviously no one expects the buffs to compete for a Pac-12 title necessarily, but tonight the offense was very competent. They were explosive. So if you can turn around that defense quickly, I mean, honestly, I think this Buffs team could do some very surprising things. I'm with yep. you. Uh, one more question. Given the, uh, given the game tonight with seeing Neuer, Broussard, etc., what style or philosophy would you like the Buffs to embrace in coming weeks? Um, it, it has to start by running the football. I think that that is very obvious. That's something we expected to be saying coming out of this game. Um, what we didn't expect was for there to be the potential for somebody to say, put the ball in Sam Neuer's hands and see what happens. Um, but that is now on the table. I think that this is going to be a very balanced offense going forward. I think that um, a lot of the screens they were running, uh, there was the uh, effective screen to Brady Russell that picked up a first down. There was a second attempt for a screen toward Brady Russell where he was open. And I think Sam probably could have gotten the ball to him, but he threw it away instead. You're seeing those little bits of creativity. You're seeing like the more traditional screens that aren't to your walk or former walk on tight end. But I think that you're going to see a lot of the dynamic horizontal stuff, but with a little bit more of the downfield passing mixed in. But I, I do expect it to still be in terms of like run play percentage, I think Colorado should be up in like the top three or four in the Pac-12 still. And I love that. That's what makes that's what when the Buffs have been great, that's what they do. They run the rock, uh, and they are really good at it. So they should continue doing. Um, I'm just I, like I had no expectations. I really wanted to have low expectations coming into this game, and I enjoyed the game a million times more with those low expectations. Um, not, like even when they were giving up the lead, I was just like, ah, whatever happens, I'm ha I'm proud of them. They, you know, they went out there and they look like a competent football team. I want to see them. My expectation was for them to be better tonight, better in game six than they were tonight. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for them to get better, and if they can keep winning football games and learning at the same time, it's it's gonna be it, this is gonna be great. Um, I think that people can finally get off Carl Durrell's, you know what. And they can finally get off Sam Neuer's, you know what, and let these guys go out there and do what they do. Um, Sam Neuer's a quarterback, and he knows what he's doing out there. Carl Durrell is a football coach, and he knows what he's doing out there. So let them do it, and uh, and we'll see what else happens. Yep, and, and just to tie a bow on that too, this team plays so well with the lead because it builds into that philosophy. You know, they, they, they got gift-wrapped 14 points from turnovers in that first quarter, and that really helped them establish the run and, you know, exercise the demons in the trenches. So moving forward, obviously, I don't think you're going to be handed two turnovers like that, but they need to get on the board. you got to put seven up on that first drive. you got to try and put up 10 or 14 after that second drive because if you can just instill that fear in your opponent, 
and you know make sure that they know what you're going to do is that you're going to pound the rock and you're going to win the game like that. I think that's how this team wins the game, like you like you both touched on. So getting a lead early is super important in that. And and if they do it, I mean, Jared Broussard can just average six yards per carry and just take this team to undefeated. There we go. There we- Love it. Uh, that's going to do it for today. We'll be doing these live streams after every single game, though. And to be honest, I think this will probably be the worst one just because we aren't in person. So if you like this, you're going to really like what's coming next Saturday and for the next five Saturdays after that. Uh, we'll be answering questions, so make sure you throw those questions in. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like this channel. No, like this video. Subscribe to this channel. You'll get alerts whenever we're going live. Uh, so much fun. Thanks guys for jumping on and, uh, we'll do it again next week. Let's go buffed.